Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you all coming, and uh, I think you'll all be highly rewarded for for what is going to happen here today. Uh, in thinking about this in the middle of the night when I started wondering what's going to happen today, it, it came to mind something I don't think about a lot, that actually the humanist community was basically founded in an environment of rationally emotive behavior therapy. Uh, Royce Jones, one of our members, was a, a practicing uh, psychologist, whatever, with, with rational emotive behavior therapy. He taught also at, at uh, uh, at our local college, whatever the name is. And uh, uh, and also Bob Erdman was deeply involved in that. So uh, in my mind, that's part of what laid a, a basis for a sensible kind of, of humanist community. We probably the longest running humanist uh, community in the United States of America, and one of the ones known mostly around the US for, for the range of programs we've had over the 50 or 60 years um, since that. Uh, and for me personally, it's, it's been a, a tremendous value because I, that's where I learned about rational emotive behavior therapy, and it, it, and it for, for me, turned out to be something uh, extremely important because I think as I've followed that, I've avoided a lot of the things that happen uh, in organizations when individuals don't have a good grounding about what it is they're really ab about. And to me, humanism is about community. It's about community with everybody in the world because we're all humans and we have that in common so we can connect on that basis. And the, the basic idea is we all have to find our own way, but we can use uh, all the resources available to, uh, to come to the best position we're able to at that moment of our life. But I, in, I include rationally emotive behavior therapy in my book, How to Live the Good Life, a user's guide for uh, human beings, for modern humans. On page 206, I say, uh, if an individual wants to step out of the callow behavior of blame and, and deal with what is actually happening and over which they have some control, then they are ready to recognize that emotions are not caused by what happens out there, but come out of beliefs as we interpret the things life throws at us. And this takes us to Rationally Motive Behavior Therapy, REBT, developed by Dr. Albert Ellis and put into very useful and usable form by Dr. Michael Edelstein, who will be talking to us now about rational emotive behavior theory. Can we give him a good hand? Thank you, Art, for that nice introduction. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Once again, I've spoken uh, to the humanist community uh, many times, and I always look forward to it. I find that they're usually very, very good, interesting questions uh, f from my talk. I mean that sincerely. George Burns said, the key to success with people is sincerity. If you can fake that, you've got it made. <laughs> you've, probably, you've probably heard some of the following statements or even made them yourself. I'm angry because that crazy driver just cut me off. I'm hurt because my friend rejected me. I'm depressed because I just lost my job. Now intuitively, there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with those statements uh, psychologically, but there's something very wrong, and that is they all assume that their emotions came from this bad situation from the adversity. And one of the things that Albert Ellis, the founder of REBT, teaches is that it's never 
situations themselves, no matter how bad, that causes our emotions, but rather it's our thinking about those situations. And that's a very powerful idea because if we're upset or disturbed, anxious, depressed, angry, often we can't change the situation that was part of those emotions, that was the activating event, but we can change our thinking about those situations. So that gives us a lot of power and control over our emotions. So keep that in mind when you think psychologically about yourself, others, and the world. Now, when you have a disturbed emotion, like guilt, shame, resentment, or depression, it also comes from your thinking, and that's from a particular type of thinking. It comes from absolutistic demands, musts, shoulds, supposed tos, have tos, demands we put on ourselves and others. When you're feeling anxious, depressed, or angry, that's a red flag saying there's a demand in your head. There's some absolutistic thinking in your head in the form of a must or a should. And it's one of three core demands. The first is a demand on oneself and takes the form of, I must do well and get approval or else I'm no good. That leads to depression, anxiety, guilt, and embarrassment. The second demand is a demand on others and that takes the form of, you must treat me well and if you don't, you're no good. That leads to anger, resentment, and hostility. The third demand is not a demand on others or oneself, not a demand on people. It's an impersonal demand, a demand on the condi conditions of one's life and takes the form of life must be fair, easy, and hassle-free or else it's no good. I'll be miserable forever. That leads to procrastination and addictions. So this is how you diagnose your psychological problem, by tracking it down to one of these three main demands. Now you may have heard of the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which psychologists and psychiatrists use to diagnose people's problems. And there are all kinds of fancy labels, uh, such as borderline personality disorder, and uh, generalized anxiety disorder, and major depression, and uh, cyclothymia, all kinds of things like that. And I don't find that very useful, but you now can diagnose a psychological problem more effectively than most psychologists and psychologists and psychiatrists who use the DSM because you can diagnose it in terms of what people are actually thinking rather than a label and then once you understand what you're thinking then that tells you what to do about it change your thinking and the way to change your thinking is by using the same process we use to think scientifically we set up our hypothesis such as uh, let's say I got fired and I'm depressed so that means I'm telling myself something like I should not have gotten fired this proves I'm a worthless loser so I set that up as a hypothesis and look for evidence is it true what is the evidence that I should not have gotten fired and how does getting fired turn me into a worthless loser if you think about it you see there's never any evidence for shoulds and musts they're absolutes they're fictions they lead to global evaluations they don't help they just make you feel worse so they're not very pragmatic but there is evidence for your preference all demands come from strong preferences. I prefer not to get fired 
Well, that makes sense. I prefer not to get fired because it goes against my objectives in life. It may be more difficult to pay the rent. It may be a very arduous process to find another job. So there are many reasons why it would be preferable based on my goals not to get fired. But there's no reason I absolutely must have what's preferable in my life. I'm just a subjective human who doesn't run the universe, so things often will happen that we don't like. Now, if you show yourself that the reality that the must is false, but the preferences make sense, and you convince yourself of that and internalize a philosophy of desiring rather than demanding, then you won't suffer from these psychological problems, or if you do suffer from them, you know how to uh, uproot them. You can put this approach in a very useful flowchart, and it's called A, B, C, D, E, F, or in my book, Three Minute Therapy, I call it a three minute exercise. It just takes a few minutes to do it. So. Uh, a stands for activating events. So you write down the situation, I was fired. B, you write down your irrational belief, I should not be fired. I'm no good. C stands for undesirable emotional consequences. I'm depressed. So with A, B, and C, we pretty much diagnose the problem. What happened, what we were telling ourselves, and how we felt. Then we go on to the change part of it with D, E, and F. D is disputing or questioning your irrational thinking, looking for the evidence. What's the evidence I should not have been fired? And then go on to answer it at E, effective new philosophy. There's no evidence I should or must not be fired. Part of a job is risking losing it. Although I prefer not to be fired, it is very disadvantageous to have been fired, but not the end of my world. I can go on and get another job eventually. I don't like being unemployed, but I definitely can stand what I don't like. I've survived unemployment before, and I'll survive it in the future. Having been fired only proves about my worth, at the very worst, is that I'm an imperfect human who acts imperfectly, not a worthless loser. It's not the situation itself of being fired that forces me to feel depressed, but rather it's my musty thinking, my demands about it that causes my depression, and with practice I can change my thinking. I can learn to accept myself unconditionally as the fallible human I am rather than damn and condemn myself when I do poorly or things go wrong in my life. I can still have a happy life unemployed, although I'd be much happier with a job. And then well, that leads to F, your new feeling, which would be Still a negative feeling, you don't want to be happy about having lost your job, but an appropriate negative feeling, a helpful negative feeling such as great disappointment, great concern, profound frustration about being out of work, and then using that as more motivation to look for a job. So that's the three minute exercise, and you can practice that. But the question is, just by writing it out once really isn't going to change much. The way to change your thinking, to deeply feel it and believe it and act on it, is by using the same learning process we use with most things, and that says reinforcement is the royal road to learning. The way we learn something is through practice, reinforcement, review, going over it again and again and again. So if you do this, it's important that you write out these three-minute exercises on your various musts and shoulds on a regular basis to get it into your brain. So that's basically the approach of rational motive behavior therapy, and this 
can be applied to almost any psychological and behavioral problem, uh, disturbed emotions that I mentioned, and uh, self-defeating behaviors such as procrastination and addictions. It happens that the most common problem people have, and most psychologists don't recognize it because they probably have the same problem, is procrastination, putting things off because of a demand you have. Let's suppose you have dishes to wash and you think, oh, I'll wash them later, I'll wash them tomorrow, I'll wash them at the end of the week. Uh, usually there's a must there. It must be easy and fun to wash the dishes, and it's not. It's uncomfortable and frustrating. And I can't stand facing the discomfort, so I'll do it later or I'll do it tomorrow. And it's the same thing with addictions. So you have an urge to smoke, and you say to yourself, I prefer to satisfy this urge, and I absolutely must. Now, if you're just stuck with the preference, then you could say, well, I prefer to satisfy my urge to smoke, but I have a larger preference not to die by, with lung cancer, so I'll face the immediate discomfort and uh, in the long run be healthier and happier. But if you stick with the must, I must satisfy my urge right now, then you give in to the urge to smoke or drink or get high or overeat and then you have pleasure for the moment Normally it does give you pleasure, but it makes life much worse for you in the long run. When you have a problem such as these, the procrastination or addiction problems, that's called low frustration tolerance or low discomfort tolerance. You haven't learned to tolerate discomfort and accept discomfort in the short term. And that's a very valuable lesson because life consists of one frustration after another. It always has and it always will, and there's no reason why it should not. So once you learn to have high frustration tolerance, high discomfort tolerance, then you'll do much better in life and get much more enjoyment, be more productive because you're willing to face discomfort. <coughs> Okay, I'll turn this over now to Art and uh, questions from the audience. Art, are you around? Yeah, I'm sitting here quietly wondering. <laughs> it all sounds so easy when you say it. <laughs> and since I've gone through those procedures, I know sometimes trying to work them out takes a little work, and that's why we need an expert to give us a hand. Maybe I should start uh, with my last question, which which is a, sort of a, in a lighter to get us all in the proper mode, um, and it re this is really too early to say it, but I'm going to do it anyway. Dr. Edelstein, if rationally motivated behavior therapy is so great, how come there are starving children in Outer Mongolia? Well. That's a very good question, which I've been thinking about a lot. <laughs> and I think the reason is the Humanist Society in Outer Mongolia has not yet invited me to give a talk there. <laughs> but since you're all humanists, you can uh, lean on them to do so. Well answered, as it should have been. OK, now back to reality. You've already told us what rationally motivated behavior therapy is and talked a little bit about uh, other options, but I think it's, it would be useful if you could explain in a little more depth how rationally motivated behavior therapy adopts from, say, psychotherapy or other brands of cognitive therapy. Okay, that's a very good question. And uh, Albert Ellis devised REBT in the 50s, and it was the first cognitive behavior therapy and it spawned many others after that. Uh, so the general term that's used these days is CBT, Cognitive Behavior Therapy, 
but it all comes back to the pioneering work of Albert Ellis, who was um, awarded Humanist of the Year many years ago. Now, one of the main differences between REBT and CBT, General Cognitive Behavior Therapy, is that REBT uh, narrows down emotional disturbance to musts and shoulds, to one main concept. If you give up your musts and shoulds, then you'll be declared sane. Whereas cognitive behavior therapy usually looks at what they call 10 distorted cognitions. And David Burns, who's a, a local psychologist and wrote a bestseller list, Feeling Good, uh, bestseller, Feeling Good, which was on the New York Times bestseller list for many years, popularized this idea of cognitive distortions. And cognitive distortions are thoughts like, which he labels, uh, one is um, mind reading or fortune telling. So you might think, well, uh, I just spoke to this person and he doesn't like me. Uh, and that's called mind reading because uh, the assumption is you can read their mind, you know what they thought, and, and the cognitive therapist would explain to you, well, you don't know what this person thought. They could be frowning because they're depressed, they had a bad day, they have something in their eyes. So uh, you're just reading their mind, uh, and that doesn't really help you. Whereas what REBT explains is that these cognitive distortions come from a more fundamental philosophy, a, a philosophy of demanding and commanding. So if you think someone's disapproving of you, it comes from the belief that I must have this person's approval, and because the person frowned or looked away, this proves that they don't like me, I'm no good, and that leads to the mind reading. Another cognitive distortion is all or none thinking, which is uh, an example of that might be, I made a couple of mistakes on the exam, therefore I failed. That would be all or none thinking because you're assuming that you have to do perfectly, otherwise you're gonna fail. Whereas REBT shows that goes back to an irrational belief, a core demand, I must do well or else I'm no good. So because the must is an absolute, therefore you're intolerant of any mistakes you might have made and conclude, because I made a few mistakes, I failed. Uh, so that's another example of how a cognitive distortion is a derivative of the musts and shoulds. Another uh, major difference between REBT and, on one hand, cognitive behavior therapy and all the other therapies, on the other hand, is in terms of self-esteem. Whereas most therapists, if you're feeling depressed and you feel bad about yourself, they'll give you various ways to uh, pick up your self-esteem by thinking good of yourself. Well, it's true, you just lost all your life savings, but you're a kind person, so you're not so bad. Uh, or you're authentic in the way you deal with people, you're honest, so you're really a good person. But REBT takes an entirely different view, and it says the whole idea of self-esteem is a toxic, false idea. Because self-esteem involves rating your total self based on your behaviors. So if I lost all my money, I could say that's bad, and maybe I made unwise investments, so that's bad, my behavior is bad, makes sense to rate your behavior so you try to do better next time, but then you, if you connect that with self-esteem, you connect the bad behavior with yourself and say, therefore, I'm a bad self, I'm no good, I'm a loser, and that is false because the rating of your behavior is not the rating of your total self. You're a process, not a product. You're always changing, and you uh, and it's an overgeneralization. Also, 
because it implies that because you're a bad person, you're only and always going to act badly. And obviously, you always can change if you work at it and you know how to work at it. So, so REBT shows you how to give up self-esteem, high or low, and in its place adopt unconditional self-acceptance. Accepting yourself unconditionally as the imperfect person you are, whether you do well or poorly, people love you or hate you, you're still the same imperfect human. Another difference between REBT and CBT on one hand and the traditional therapies on the other is that REBT and CBT assume that the reason you have emotional and psychological problems is because of your thinking in the present. Whereas the traditional therapies, starting with Sigmund Freud, assumed that the reason you have problems now is because of your childhood. Your parents were abusive or you family was dysfunctional uh, or you, you used your parents as a role model and they put themselves down so now you're putting yourself down but that's false and I've worked with clients who said they, had, they come from very loving homes, their parents were very good to them yet they're anxious and depressed and I've worked with other clients who said the reason they're anxious and depressed is because their parents were so critical of them or absent from home and, and the real issue is whether your disturbance comes from your childhood, which I believe it doesn't, or it doesn't come from your childhood, the solution is changing your thinking now because that's the main issue in terms of emotional disturbance. So those are some of the main contrasts. Since Dr. Uh, Edelstein would also like to hear from, if you have questions now as you're sitting there, uh, so we are dealing with the here and now, not necessarily things that I thought about uh, over the recent weeks. So if any of you do ha have a question you would like Dr. Edelstein to deal with, just raise your hand and Greg will bring the microphone to you and uh, we'll let you ask the next question. Not here. Okay. Um, uh, the, the last thing you said was kind of interesting because I've always thought that um, you know a lot of therapy has you know about you know you got to love yourself, you got to feel good about yourself, and all that stuff, which creates a high burden because if you fail to do that, then you uh, are a failure. You know, and that, that if you can create a mindset where the way you feel about yourself doesn't matter. You know that you know I'm one of seven billion people on the planet. And, you know, there's nothing all that special about me, you know, and that way you, you relieve yourself of the burden of having to maintain, you know, something ab about yourself that you have to feel good about. Then, you know, you have all this free energy to go out and, you know, experience the world and lowering the bar is the secret to success, you know, I mean, so well, what's your thoughts on that? Well, you made a number of interesting points there. One was uh, how you feel about yourself doesn't matter. And I think I know what you mean, but I would put it a little, dif a little differently. And uh, that is, well, your feelings do matter to you because you're stuck with you 24 hours a day. And if you're feeling depressed, that's not going to be very pleasant. And if you're feeling happy, that's going to uh, bode much better for you. So in that sense, you would like to have good feelings, and the way you have good feelings, uh, if you give up self-esteem and have unconditional self-acceptance, is by setting goals, setting objectives, and trying to work toward them. And then if your ego isn't on the line, whether or not you succeed, then you can enjoy the process of working toward your goal. And if you do happen to succeed, feel good about it, but not feel good about you. So I do agree that giving that up would, uh, would help free you and free your emotions to have a better life. Now there was something you said all the way at the end that I wanted to comment on. The, the secret of success is lowering the bar. Oh yes, right, very good. The secret of success is lowering the bar. Uh, I have a different view and that is uh, I think you can have a very high bar and I think that's very good because 
if you have high hopes for yourself and high goals, that's a motivator to work toward it. But as long as you don't have a must or a should, I must achieve this goal, then you could still work toward it, enjoy the process, and even possibly succeed. I say in my book, Three Minute Therapy, that one of my goals is a very high bar, and that's to get my book on the New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> I probably have a better chance of getting hit by a meteor walking down the street. <laughs> but I realize that it's not very likely, but that's okay because that's a motivator to me to work toward that goal by giving talks and now doing YouTubes, which I have many of, and getting the word out in various ways. And it's disappointing that when I looked at the New York Times bestseller list this morning, my book wasn't on it yet, but uh, I'm still enjoying the process. So, uh, so I think the confusion is when people say don't have, high, don't have a high bar, they're thinking that embedded in that high bar is a must or should, I must achieve it. But if you take that out, then uh, you're OK. But thanks for the question. It was an excellent question. Hi. Uh, your comments near the end uh, reminded me, you know, this idea of, oh, you know, my parents, I'm a victim, or, you know, whatever. Um, back in the 60s, it reminds me of West Side Story and the Jets' confrontation with Officer Krupke. I'm depraved on a can of I'm deprived. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Love it. Um, Questions relating to culture and values and how it relates to what you're talking about. Some cultures uh, emphasize responsibility and discipline. Uh, some cu cultures emphasize um, I'd rather be respected and others emphasize I'd rather be liked. And uh, you know, some, some other cultures uh, are just the opposite of discipline and responsibility, uh, like, you know, manana, I'll get to it, you know what you were talking about. Your thoughts about the interrelationships there, thank you. Yeah, good question, and uh, I'm glad you brought up the issue of culture because uh, REBT is a culture-free approach because it doesn't tell you what good the good values are. As you were saying, different cultures have different values that they uh, value highly. REBT just says, if you're disturbed about not achieving your culture's values, then you have absolutistic thinking, you have musts and shoulds, and people have the tendency to escalate their preferences into demands, and they do it in all cultures, all through history, and the reason they do it is because of their imperfect brains, which were forged uh, over thousands of years, millions of years, uh, because at one time, a million years ago, it might have been functional to think in terms of these overgeneralizations, but these days it isn't. And uh, so you can use this uh, approach in various cultures. And in fact, my book, Three Minute Therapy, has been translated into Japanese, so if you want to read the Japanese version, you can get that. Hi, uh, question back here. My name is Robert. Um, I used to read about REBT, and when I tried to apply it in my own life, I kind of reached a sticking point because I came across this realization that my thoughts seemed to be taking the form of like images or or like moving images rather than complete sentences. Like I must do this in order to be a success, something like that. Have you come across that at all in your patients? Uh, yes, Robert, and uh, I think that's a very good point, that most of us think in terms of words, automatic kind of thoughts like that, but some of us, like Robert, thinks in terms of images, and uh, for that, REBT does address that, and Albert Ellis uh, devised uh, an imaging exercise for that, which he called rational emotive imagery, and I have in my book, I just called it three-minute imagery. Uh, just to indicate that it's really not a very arduous or long process. It just takes a couple of minutes to do. But if you practice it, it could be very effective. And getting back to the example I gave, 
you would picture, vividly picture, being unemployed. So you've been unemployed for a few days, now for a few weeks, a few months, a few years. You exaggerate the image for effect. And wh while you're picturing that, you get in touch with your disturbed feelings. You feel depressed, miserable, suicidal while you're picturing being unemployed. And you just do that for a few seconds. You don't want to reinforce that too much. And then you change the feeling by changing thoughts about it by saying to yourself while picturing being unemployed, you say to yourself, it's not the end of the world. I, can st I still have some things in life I enjoy, although I prefer to be employed. There's no reason why I have to be right now. This just proves I'm an imperfect human, not a worthless loser. I don't like being unemployed. I can stand it, etc. Uh, you show yourself why, why the, the thinking doesn't work, why you're picturing being unemployed and putting those words to the image. So that's one way you can uh, work with images in, uh, and use the REBT theory. Uh, what, <clears throat> excuse me, what, what about the issue of, of genetics? Okay, very good question, the issue of genetics. And Albert Ellis was uh, one of the first psychologists who said that our, our personality and emotions are influ have a few influences, and one is genetics, our genetic predispositions. So just to take uh, a simple example in another area, I could start practicing uh, singing at the age of four and practice for 20 years and I still wouldn't be able to carry a tune very well except maybe happy birthday. Uh, but Mozart uh, started playing the piano at the age of four and composing symphonies. Is it because he practiced more than I practiced? That's not the reason. The reason is he obviously had a genetic proclivity to be a genius at music. So, um, so genes play an important role in our talents, abilities, weaknesses, and our thinking. So some people are more talented to be emotionally disturbed than others, but that our thinking mediates our genetic proclivities and our emotions. So if you work very hard at changing your thinking in the ways I described, you can improve to a great extent, maybe not as, as well as someone else who is born with a sane gene rather than an insane gene, but you can still uh, improve to a great extent. So uh, that would be the relation. Now another uh, question related to, to this issue is medication. Uh, some people say, well, if it's, uh, if it's your thinking, then how come medication helps? Or if medication helps, what does it have to do with your thinking? Or should I, I'm depressed, should I take an antidepressant? And the answer is, as I indicated, they're both influences on our emotions. And it's up to you whether you'd like to do the therapy route, especially the REBT therapy route, or the medication route, or I get some clients who use both they are on some medication that helps somewhat, but then they work on the REBT to do even better. There have been some studies testing uh, cognitive behavior therapy against medication, and the results have been that they both do equally as well in the short term, but in the long term, once a person stops taking the medication, often they go back to their <laughs> pre-medication state, whereas if they have changed their philosophy, their basic outlook, then that tends to last much longer. Uh, as far as uh, medication, <coughs> excuse me, for people who are interested in medication, it's really a trial and error basis. It's still in a primitive uh, science. So it mean, might mean trying one medication and seeing if that works, if it doesn't, trying another or trying another. And if you try one, it could work for a while and then it could uh, stop working, 
or a low dose might not work that well, but a higher dose might work better or vice versa. So it means a lot of experimentation if you want to try that. Yes. Uh, my wife and I have been happily married for the past 18 years, but recently she has plastered the, the house with signs that say, don't, uh, don't touch Bill or you'll be sent to jail. Don't touch Bill or you'll be sent to jail? Yeah. And I, I, I'm, are not you Bill? A I'm not a cop. <laughs> are you Bill? I'm Bill. Yeah. So, uh, so it's a question what to do? Yes. Yeah. So if you have a, a problem with someone, this is a good example, uh, if you have a problem with someone, the f I would say the first step is to find out what the problem is. So if the signs say don't, don't touch Bill, then uh, the first suggestion I would give you is ask her what she means by don't touch Bill and what's behind it. Have you tried that? Uh, somewhat, yeah. And what, what has she said? Well, she, she says that uh, there, was, there was an incident uh, a few years ago in which uh, uh, she wound up uh, in jail. Uh, but they sent her, they decided she hadn't uh, committed any crime, so they sent her back home. And uh, I think that's probably burned into her psyche a bit. Uh, that, that she thinks that if I do some, if if uh, she does something, that I'm going to send her to jail. I don't have any, I don't have have any uh, way of doing that, nor do I wish to do it. Okay, so let's suppose she has this entrenched idea that uh, you might do something that's going to send her to jail, and don't touch Bill means don't relate to Bill or something like that, so you're less likely to do something, then you have a few choices. The first uh, is acceptance. Accept that's the way she is, and in order to be in the relationship, it means uh, that you've decided that the advantages of the relationship outweigh the disadvantages, and all relationships have their disadvantages, so that gets back to acceptance. Then the next step would be to try to talk to her further and see if you can work this out or maybe go for counseling with her and ultimately decide whether the advantages of the relationship outweigh the disadvantages or vice versa. And if the disadvantages outweigh the advantages, then you might want to consider moving on to another relationship where the calculus is reversed. But the main thing is not upsetting yourself about it, not disturbing yourself about it, not have must, like she must treat me well, or she must be reasonable. Those are false because the musts are false. You prefer she treat you better, and you prefer she be reasonable, but if she's not, that's unpleasant, unfortunate, but you'll survive. So, so that's the basic outline in working with uh, relationship problems. Thank you. You're welcome. I'd, I'd like to ask a question relative to, I understand that since traveling is sometimes difficult, that you have ways to interact with persons who, who would like to explore and, and use rationally emotive behavior therapy that doesn't involve driving great distances and such. Could you talk something about that? Yeah, thanks for asking that, Art. And that is, I do have an in-person private practice in San Francisco and Mill Valley and Marin County. But uh, more, I have more and more clients internationally and people who don't live near me uh, by phone and Skype. So, uh, and that works quite well. So phone and Skype sessions are always an option. Hi. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, my name is Daniel, are. and uh, first of all, thank you for uh, talking here. Um, so I got introduced to REBT through uh, Smart Recovery, and um, I can actually say that it was probably, um, you know, uh, pretty um, spectacular when coming from 12-step groups to that. Uh, I w it's uh, what you've been t talking about and uh, what I learned there. Uh, I, I put it into practice throughout my life. So when you said that um, you know people with uh, addiction problems um, and people with um, procrastination problems both have you know low distress tolerance, um, you know I thought that was interesting. And so I thought, well, maybe how can I put 
the things that I've learned and the things you're teaching, you know, into my procrastination problem. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I have big things that I procrastinated about, you know, which, you know, new, uh, you know, school or career to go into, um, and I, you know, I put it aside or, you know, doing the dishes, like you said. Um, so do you think people, when they're dealing with some of this stuff, um, are able to uh, be more successful with the smaller stuff and move over to the bigger stuff or start with big stuff and conquer that and, um, you know, feel like a superstar. Uh, and then, you know, all the little stuff is easier. Yeah, okay, that's an interesting question. Uh, when you work on low frustration toler tolerance, would it be good to start with the smaller stuff or the bigger stuff? And the answer is uh, there are individual differences as far as this goes. Some people find it more helpful to do it one, use one approach and others the other approach, starting with the bigger thing or alternatively the smaller thing. So the way to uh, judge that is through experimentation and trial and error. Try one approach and if that works for you, then you discovered what works for you. If not, try the other approach. If neither works very well, then just do it. Just face the discomfort whether it's a large task or a small task, just face the discomfort and do it and show yourself there's no reason why it has to be comfortable and the discomfort of washing the dishes or applying for a job won't kill you, it'll be uncomfortable, but that's all. It won't be the end of your life and you'll learn from it because you might learn to be more tolerant of discomfort. Now one thing you can do with big tasks if you're better at small tasks, is break it down into small tasks, small steps. Uh, so whatever it is, uh, the, the first step might even be put uh, a pencil and paper on your desk, and then the next step would be just write something on it, and then if you keep on going along the step ladder, you might wind up with the great American novel. In fact, Ernest Hemingway said, the way I write is by I sit down in the morning every day for an hour and write whatever comes to mind, even if it's gibberish, but I write an hour every day. So uh, that's some of the approaches there. Thank you. You're welcome. Michael. Yeah. Oh. Hi, uh, um, my name is Carl, and I wanted to ask you a question. I myself have worked with REBT, and I have a friend in particular. I was wondering, you know, in terms of, in order to make the change work, you talk about repetition, right? The question is, in your experience, how much repetition is required to break fairly challenging habits like general anxiety disorder or whatever it normally referred to as anxiety about anxiety, that sort of thing? I'm just curious what your experience has been with your patients. Uh, with my patients, my experience has been there's a wide range, again, again we get back to individual differences like in the former question, uh, some people pick it up right away, but that's rare. It just clicks with them that there are no musts, they're not a bad person, just an imperfect person no matter how poorly they do. Uh, other people, it takes, uh, it might take years and years of continued practice to get to their goal. But the average that I found in my practice is something like eight to 10 sessions if someone works conscientiously at the goals. And one of the differences between REBT and many other therapies is at the end of my session, we always come up with specific goals, specific things a person can work on. And usually one of the goals is write out a three minute exercise once a day or twice a day or 10 million times a day and do some reading such as Three Minute Therapy or many of the books of Albert Ellis. There are over 80 books that Albert Ellis wrote. Uh, so those are various things that you could do. But, uh, but the average is eight to 10 sessions. Hi. Thanks. Um, I'm wondering, you may have answered this partially, but I'm wondering what the relationship would be between, or how you would tell the difference in your own life between prioritizing and procrastinating. Because for instance, you could say, you know, but, um, I'm not gonna do the dishes, no, excuse me, the other way around. I'm, I'm not going to update my will, it's an example from real life, um, because I need to do the dishes, or vice versa. All right, good question, and I actually addressed that in 
uh, my chapter in my book on procrastination. And procrastination really means to delay or put off. So in your example, which is a good one, there's reasonable delay and unreasonable delay. So your question is, how do you figure out what the reasonable de delay is? But everything we do in life, uh, usually we have competing goals and objectives and competing things we can do at any given time. And we're always uh, sort of automatically or semi-automatically deciding something has priority. It's a, it's a larger uh, goal or more important for various reasons. So whatever we wind up doing uh, demonstrates that uh, we thought that was the most important thing. So in terms of prioritizing, one technique you can use is make a list of all the things that you want to get done for a particular day or week. And then next to each item, if it's very, very important, put the letter A. If it's not that important, minor importance, put the letter C and everything in between is B. And then do the A items first and then the B and then the C. So that's one way of prioritizing. But as you're, as you're saying, you're always going to procrastinate on the lesser valued items in favor of the more important items. So that would be reasonable procrastination. Uh, you spoke early in your talk about uh, <clears throat> For instance, uh, not having shoulds. I should not have been fired. Well, what if there is hard evidence that you should not have been fired, that it was uh, due to your boss's uh, own warped uh, association? I mean, and I, I'm thinking of anger, not, right, not depression. Uh, uh, and suppose you had been the top salesman in the company, and you knew you were, and yet you had been fired. And then, unless somebody else can tell you another reason that you were fired, then you're angry about it. You said, oh, his, he wanted to give his son-in-law that position. So uh, why shouldn't you be angry? Right. Well, that's, that uh, question brings up an important distinction uh, in terms of terminology and also emotions. And uh, REBT doesn't say you shouldn't be angry because that's another should. <laughs> REBT avoids musts and shoulds. But it says uh, usually anger just eats you up inside and doesn't help. So if you don't want to be angry, we have a way we can uh, get you over your anger. But if you want to be angry, go ahead and keep up those shoulds and musts. And instead of doing rational emotive behavior therapy, you can do irrational emotive behavior <laughs> therapy on yourself and be even more angry if, if you like. Uh, now, in terms of the shoulds, it's true that sometimes you have a reasonable should, such as if I want to get to the airport, by 12 noon, I should leave my house by 11.30. So in terms of terminology, every area of knowledge has their own specific meanings of words. For example, take the word apple. Now, if you bit into your apple computer uh, for, <laughs> as part of your meal, you're going to have a rude awakening. Whereas if you uh, get an apple from the grocery store and you start typing on it, you're not going to get very far. So because they have different definitions, same word, but different definitions. So in REBT, we're talking about psychopathological shoulds and musts. And that means shoulds and musts that lead to emotional disturbance, not if then should and musts. If I want to be healthy, uh, I should eat fruits and vegetables and avoid cotton candy. That's of if then. Uh, and, that, and assuming you're not stressed about it, you could stress yourself about eating the right food, a lot of people do, uh, then it's OK as a should or a must. But if it's making you angry, as in the example uh, you brought up, then we call anger an emotional disturbance. But as I said, you have a right to your emotional disturbance, and you could keep it. Did that answer the question? I think so. Yeah? OK. <laughs> think about it. If, if you have another part to it, let me know. 
Hi, thank you. Uh, some additional uh, thought on procrastination. Um, IBM had a technique as an alternative that they found very effective. Um, not only doing the A, B, C, D, because with that technique, you never get to the Ds. Their um, give A's maybe two hours, maybe C's one hour. But this way, you get to them all. And they also found that, again, depending on the task or thing, um, after two hours or so, uh, you tend not to be as effective. So your thoughts about an alternative approach? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. There are many alternative uh, behavioral approaches to procrastination and addictions and other problems. And REBT basically says, well, experiment with different ones and see what works for you. And the IBM one, I can see, would be very helpful with some people, but not so much with others. So uh, the more techniques you have at your fingertips, the better chance you have of finding something that works for you. So thanks for letting us know about that one. I, I wonder if I could just make a comment on this um, uh, procrastination thing. One thing I found in trying to apply rational and motor behavior therapy is, I guess this is sort of like a Buddhist idea, like, uh, okay, so what's so, why is washing dishes such a terrible, awful thing to do? And, and I think, you know, actually if you can get in there and figure out how to get the stuff off and whatever, it can be more of a pleasurable thing, but that's just one way to think about it. Right. One of the things the Buddhists say about washing dishes, um, what well, one Buddhist said about it is, most people wash dishes to get them clean. I wash dishes to wash dishes. <laughs> <laughs> Really enjoying your talk. Um, I've discovered about myself that the way to get myself to wash dishes is to be able to sit down on a comfy chair and turn on some good classical music and compete with myself to see how fast I can get them done this time. And that works for me. Uh, a question for you. Um, is anger ever a good motivator? I find myself getting very angry about things, and that motivates me for a while. And I'm just wondering, is it good to sustain one's anger in order to accomplish things? Well, again, it's individual differences. If you find anger motivates you and uh, has more advantages and disadvantages, certainly use it. I'd be somewhat skeptical because my view is, and the RBT view is, what's motivating you is not so much the anger, but the passion behind it. So, uh, as I said, the way we come to anger is by starting, by starting with a strong preference. I strongly prefer X, Y, or Z, uh, and this motivates me to do it, and then because I'm human, I escalate the strong preference into a must, you must treat me well, for example, uh, because I prefer you treat me well, and that might motivate you to discuss with the other person the problem, but it's really the preference behind it, and to test this hypothesis, uproot your anger by uprooting the demands, but stick with the strong preference, and then see if you accomplish the same things, maybe even more and better. But that would be my prediction that you would. I have a question. Uh, thanks very much first for, uh, for coming, giving this talk. It's very, very interesting. Um, my question is, uh, partially you respond that when uh, talk about the genetics and the influence of the, the chemistry in the brain and whatnot, uh, having it. But lately you've seen a lot of uh, talks about uh, free will. Like uh, there's an illusion of free will. I mean, Sam Harris came up with a book about free will. Uh, well, the influence of epigenetics, which is basically the manifestation of genetics in, in the world, in the, uh, influences our behavior. Um, there is several examples of uh, a strong influence of, of uh, the chemistry in your brain or brain states to any even minimal behaviors. Um, how can you go against that? I mean, something like 
we basically don't have a free will because it's all in your brain, in your in your in your mental state, or your sorry, in your brain state, uh, and therefore it's kind of futile in a way to go against trying to have that cigarette, for instance. Uh, there is evidence, for instance, they, they do MRI imaging in people that they have a choice between having the cigarette or not having the cigarette. I think the, the experiment is different, but it's something similar. And they already see that even before doing the action of taking the cigarette, the brain already light up on the, on the, on, on the behavior that has to be uh, avoided. You know? So how the rational emotional behavioral therapy address this in terms of the, 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 the epigenetics and the, the free will issue? Yeah, that's, well, thank a, you. that's a good question. And by the way, I uh, was converted to Sam Harris's position by reading his book. It's an excellent book. It's just called Free Will. And uh, the REBT really doesn't delve into the philosophical issue. Is there free will or is there not free will? Albert Ellis believed we had limited free will. But whether you're, you're a determinist or you're a believer in free will, uh, the solution is the same, and that is if you have emotional disturbance or behavioral problems, change your thinking. And people change their thinking whether they have free will or they don't have free will. People still change their thinking through practice, repetition, and reinforcement. So that really is the REBT bottom line on that. But if anyone wants to discuss free will and determinism more, uh, join me at lunch. I've done some debates on it, so I have a strong uh, ideas about it, uh, but it's unrelated to REBT and getting over emotional problems. Okay, thank you for your presentation and for answering our questions, and please feel free to join us for more discussion at lunch at the speaker's table. May I say one last thing? Yes, you I may. I have a, a website if you want more information. I have a website. It's 3minutetherapy.com. Uh, that's the name of my book, Three Minute Therapy. Three is spelled out, and it's all one word, threeminutetherapy.com. So uh, you can look at my website where I have a lot of information and ways to contact me. And also, I, have, I actually have written four books, but uh, the one that gives you the general approach to REBT and applies it to many different areas, anxiety, depression, and anger, I uh, have here if you'd like to uh, get it, see me uh, at the end of the talk. Thank you.